isn't uncommon for the subconscious to fixate on a traumatic event. Ned, tell me, are you aware of the concept of false memories? I'm not crazy. I'm not. When working with you on abductions, that we, we discussed a lot about that I want it to feel like he was on a trip. Like I wanted the colors <laughs> uh, to be a certain way. I wanted to kind of have this like kind of frantic uh, cut between close and, um, and wides and like just frantic editing throughout it. And I definitely felt that you brought that uh, and I'm really appreciative of how that came out. I, I'd like, I'd just like to talk with you about that a little bit, the experience sure. working on that film, a little bit about the pre-production and then into production. Okay. Um, I don't know what it is when, when my friends recruit me to be DP on their films, they always pick the coldest nights on the planet. Yep. <laughs> and, and I never dress properly for it, or at least it doesn't feel like it. Uh, on abductions, I was definitely far more prepared for the cold than I was on Soul Survivors. The first night on Soul Survivors, I, I thought I was going to freeze to death. Um, but the fun thing about abductions was just trying to insinuate that this is a person who's an unreliable narrator and trying to hint at that through visuals. Um, and I think it was in post-production when you and I were talking with Dylan and we had come up with the idea of using uh, this light actually back here to insinuate that maybe this isn't an alien spacecraft, maybe it's a thunderstorm that's you know affecting him because you know he's tripping on drugs potentially and the lightning is setting off his imagination and, and making him imagine things that aren't really there. And especially I, I felt like in the sound design, uh, being able to like use that thunder and put sounds in there that maybe don't sound, sometimes don't sound like a UFO or sometimes mm -hmm. sound more like a creature or like, it, it's like giving this feeling of, I don't really know what is going on right now. And there's, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we definitely uh, had some fun challenges that night. Batteries going dead. <laughs> that was my favorite. Oh. Underestimating uh, how long uh, the generator was going to last, and then, and then the fun problem you had with, and I, and I mean this completely sarcastically, <sighs> with the camera. Sorry to bring back that little PTSD right there. I'm still pissed about that. I, to this day, I still don't know what caused my sensor to flip out and think that it was in an earthquake, but I still have that camera to this day, and. Ever since that shoot, which was, uh, when did we shoot that, January? It's been a while, yeah, uh, 2019. It's been a while, and all of a sudden, it's just nothing. It, it's using the same camera, never experienced that problem before that or since then. Yeah, who? I, I've shot events outside for long periods of time. I've taken the camera inside. It's endured countless different kinds of uh, weather conditions. It's been, it runs hot, it runs cold, it's overheated on me one time. Never had that problem before or since. And I, and I remember, you know, I'm there in the woods with you guys, the batteries on the lights are going dead, the generator keeps kicking out, I'm just, I'm ready to go home and go to bed. But I got my phone and I'm just got Googling, I'm like, Ibis on Sony, freaking out, no results. Damn it! <laughs> What am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, we would just want to get the shots and go home. Uh, Definitely, so I, I, I feel we both agree that, like, we learned from that is, mm -hmm. even though it was such a pain being deep in the forest, I think it 
it definitely did sell that like lost freaky nature of it. And, and I still, uh, I'm, I'm like pixel peeping, trying to find Vince in the background with that light. And I still, uh, like that light was perfectly placed. I mean, you, you've seen the teaser too. Like Vince yeah. never showed up in the background. And that made me nervous, man. <laughs> I, remember, I, I remember taking that light up there and I'm thinking, okay, if this is how we're gonna shoot this, this is the only place where I can put this. And it was on this uneven ground where, to where all, all he would have had to do was let go of it and nudge it the wrong way and it would have just keeled over. Which ironically did wind up happening much later on in the mud after we thought we didn't have to worry about that. So it just goes to show you, you can't anticipate anything <laughs> when you're filming in the woods. Definitely putting down those tarps on the second day was a huge help, making sure there was like plastic and making sure things didn't slide. I, uh, especially even when we showed up there in the day, like nothing felt wet until it got night. And then like it, it just felt more muddy even though it hadn't rained. A lot of things that we just couldn't have foreseen happen, but I mean, but that's filmmaking. Filmmaking yeah. is a bunch of unforeseen things. And then, and then you just really hope that what you originally set out to do gets on the screen at the end. And yeah. I can definitely wholeheartedly say that the vision I was looking for, for those forest sequences with the lighting and the sporadicness of it, I fe feel like that came through. I'm glad. I'm glad that I could be a part of it and help out, you know, the, for the one night that I could be there. <laughs> Is there anything also that uh, just looking at maybe you would have done differently? What I would have done differently for for any shoot where you're dealing with uh, location cinematography, especially in deep woods, is to just plan out your trajectory. Like, okay, this is where we want to start. This is where we want to end at this point. So we could, because, I mean, you're going to have a finite set of lights that you're going to try to fix into a particular area and you know, and you just knowing where you're going to start, where you're going to stop, and then where you're going to move to and eventually end up. Uh, that was something that on Soul Survivors was a lot easier because even though it looks like we were in the deep woods, we were actually on a piece of property. And it, it was just all about, you know, the lighting and the framing to make it look, you know, like we were lost and away from civilization much further away than we actually were. But it was much easier to figure out, okay, this is where we're gonna start, this is our primary setup point, film everything here, boom, break, and then we have an entrance point, an end point for the first half of the sequence, and then we have a small breather and like a small action beat, and then we pick up the chase again, we know we're going back out this way, and then cut other side of the property, and you know, blow some shit up. That was a fun night. <laughs> well, that's the night that we were all freezing to death, but I knew that at some point, no matter how cold I was, we were gonna blow some stuff up. So I'm like, okay, all right, I have something to look forward to. I know that I'm going to enjoy this at the very end of it, no matter what. It's nice when you can show up to a set and you see stuff blow up. Yeah. I mean, even if it's just, we had little airsoft grenades. That's all it was, but it, it was cool. To, to, you know, to actually have stuff, you know, you're going to have like these big bangs and luckily, you know, we were, you know, on property, but we were kind of in the country in terms of, you know, Michigan, where your nearest neighbor is probably about a football field away. So you can light that stuff off and not really affect anybody's sleep at 2.30 in the morning. But, uh, you know, he, he, there were these airsoft grenades. I believe that, uh, that Brian filled them with a uh, baby powder. And so when they blew up, uh, the actress, Danielle, had her wireless mic on, so he, he, we have all this audio from her reacting to these things blowing up that doesn't wind up in the film. You know, she's reacting to them, and then as soon as the baby powder hits the air, and all of a sudden you just, she's like this on camera with her, her back to it, so you can't tell what she's saying, but she's like, that smells good. <laughs> uh, that was, she, she's a trip. She's a trip, but yeah, any day that you can blow stuff up blow stuff up, have some cool effects, some cool lighting, and especially if you've got a crew of people that are gonna work well together and keep it fun and fresh. You can be going two hours over schedule, but if you've got a, an excited crew of people who are just all there to make it happen and, and you know, supporting each other, keeping the energy high, you can get through it. And at the end of the day, you're gonna remember the good stuff. Absolutely.
that's something I feel that we definitely had on abductions is that we did have a fun crew that everyone was making sure that we were pushing to get that product. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was very proud of like the work that we were able to do in on, on such a low budget. Yeah. Yeah. The, the cost of pizza. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Like we, we just put all of our equipment that we individually had together and it makes it look like we had way more money than, than we actually put into it. That is one thing that I will definitely say about making movies now versus, you know, even back when I was making my student films, which was about 15 years ago now at this point, the technology's just come so far. We can do things, you know, for the cost of the equipment, either to buy it or to rent it, that filmmakers in the 1970s with millions of dollars couldn't do. It's, it's really remarkable. Yeah. So I know that you used to shoot on Panasonic and then you moved to Sony. Um, what, what are some of the reasons for that and what would it take to get you to switch uh, to Canon or p back to Panasonic? Uh, Panasonic, I'm going to be honest, I love those cameras. They are workhorses. The menu design, how easily accessible all the features are in those cameras. They're just, they're fantastic. And their color science is probably second only to Canon. Um, it's, it's, it was always very easy for me to grade when I was making, you know, weddings from that footage or even making movies from that footage. The problem that Panasonic has, and it's something that from what I understand, even in their full frame mirrorless is still a gigantic problem, is the low light capability. If you are trying to film an event with those cameras, uh, they are the antidote to creativity. <laughs> you feel completely shackled to a device that does not want you to reach your full potential. That's how it felt. And I remember the exact moment when I realized that I was going to switch to another brand. I was shooting a wedding in a church in Mount Clemens. I want to say it was St. Peter's. And it was in December. They had an evening ceremony. So there was no sunlight coming through the windows to help with anything that I was doing. All I had was the ambient church light, and I was using micro four-thirds sensors to film a wedding wide open 2.0 on everything at 3200 ISO, and it looked like garbage. And that was when I decided I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. As much as I love what can come out of these cameras when I can plan what I am using them for, I mean, I'm here earning the money that I would make to pay for th these things, and I'm not going to feel confident in what I deliver. So th that was a really easy choice for me to make at that point. And I did switch over to Canon briefly, because you know everyone tells you as a filmmaker, Canon's got the best colors, you know, you got the best sensors, everything's gonna look wonderful, they have the greatest glass. A and that is true to a point. The C100 Mark II, which is what I wound up buying, is a wonderful camera, up to 5,000 ISO. And when you're shooting events, which is what I primarily do, it's, it, that's just not enough in some circumstances. So I stuck with that for about two years because I, th I think I had a, a leasing program through Canon where I could make payments on it and pay it off in two years. And it was about midway through that that the Sony a7S II came out the low light god of the, of the universe. And I bought that thinking, you know, no matter what circumstance I'm in at this point, even when this camera, this Canon camera is completely useless, I will have this. And as soon as you have a camera that has an internal body image stabilization and can shoot in low light the way that these Sony cameras can, you're done there's no going back. It's like somebody has given you heroin for the first time and you're just chasing after that high for the rest of your life. You, there's no going back to anyone else. I mean, but Panasonic is trying with their GH5S, I believe is what it is. But even still, the low light capability starts to tap out at about half of what you can get away with on a Sony. If Sony can just get even just 60p in 4K, yeah. 
Yeah, they, they took out the ibis on for that. Like, why would you take out the ibis on a camera that's, that can shoot this kind of beautiful low light with, with Panasonic colors and 10-bit internal recording? Uh, I think they really kind of shot themselves in the foot by doing that. If they can put in some of the things that make Panasonic such a power horse right now, Sony would make like the perfect camera. But that being said, I completely agree with you because as you know, when we first started working together, I was going all Panasonic. And how was that helping you sleep? <laughs> no, it, it, it was so much anxiety because every time I would get to a reception, it's just like, well, I guess this is completely useless. I know. Like, and also, honestly, even in situations that are decently lit, like the Sony, because it's capable of doing that low light, also makes medium situations just look better. Like, I've seen a lot of comparisons between the three different cameras, and for some reason there's just this, like, there, there's this feel and style to the Sonys that I that I really appreciate. Yeah, I agree with that, for sure. Um, not too long ago, I actually borrowed a GH5 from uh, a buddy of ours, a mutual friend, Dan. And I was thinking, hey, you know, we're all off during this particular time, and I would love to see what the 4K 60p looks like out of this camera. So I took it with me to a park and just shot a whole bunch of stuff. I tried out some of the high-speed slow motion, and it all looks really wonderful. But for some reason, it still has a lot of the exposure issues and highlight clipping that I was seeing in my AF100. And that's a camera that at this point now is probably, what, nine, ten years old. So it, it's kind of disappointing to see that some of that, some of those issues with the Micro Four Thirds sensor still have not been solved. Uh, with that being said, does it look good? Oh yeah, <laughs> it looks phenomenal. The, the 4K 60p is like butter. But there, you're right, there's just something about the, the look of Sony, especially now, just since the, uh, the release of the a7 III and the hybrid log gamma profiles, they've, just, they've really started to nail the color to the point where Canon's got to be just looking over their shoulder like it's only a matter of time before these guys are like Captain America like on your left and then just blowing by. At least you know that's how it was looking a couple years ago. I think if there's anything that I can say to the people over at Sony is that please, please stop repackaging the same features and new cameras with like minor little leaps ahead. Uh, we want an A7S III. We want it more than anything in the world. Just do it. <laughs> it doesn't have to be 10-bit internal recording. I'll settle for 4K60. That's all I want. I don't, I don't want anything else. I, I just want 4K slow motion for Christmas. I've been a good boy. On abductions, uh, showing the slow motion sequences when he's like falling back, blowing it up on a big screen, I was like, nope. That's not working, and what I and what I ended up doing, I I actually because it was in widescreen anyway, I drunk it down a little bit and like filled it in, and then blurred it out, and then adding the smoke on it, and trying to get that quality back. The slow motion looks great, and those sequences had to be in slow motion, and it had to be shot on a Sony with how dark it it was. I couldn't have shot that on a Panasonic. If we had a if we had a GH five S. And it, we could have probably locked it down and added camera shake in post. Um, but it would have required, we would have needed speed booster for sure. We would have been completely restricted to the Sigma 18 to 35 in order to make sure we could get as much light on that sensor as possible. Because, I mean, with, with this Sony, which was not marketed, the, the A7S3 was, the A7 III was not marketed as a low light camera, but you could still shoot. 24,000 ISO on it, and it'll be more than usable. Uh, <laughs> the Panasonic, you know, the, their low light camera, their low light beast to 12,800, and then whew, done. Although it's it's amazing that you know, just eight years after you know, I bought my Panasonic AF100, which. I would never have dreamed wanting to shoot over 1600 ISO on that camera and get anything usable on it. Now we're talking about cameras that can shoot using available light in a car on an expressway with no lights, just using, you know, headlamps of other cars, 40,000 ISO, 80,000 ISO, no problem. <laughs> it's amazing what has happened in just the last 10 years. Absolutely. Uh, and that actually brings up a great point. What do you think 
Or do you think that we're at the point where feature films for like Netflix can be shot on these smaller uh, form factor cameras? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think Panasonic's new one, is it the S1H? Um, it, it's their, their full frame mirrorless camera actually did just become the first uh, full frame mirrorless camera to be rated for production by Netflix. So these things are within reach now. It's, it's quite fantastic. I mean, I would consider getting one if it wasn't so damn expensive just for the body. I mean, it's not Canon expensive, but it's still, it's pretty pricey. I want to say it's around like four or $5,000 just for the body of that camera. And, uh, but then of course with Canon, if you want similar features to just what I'm shooting on here right now, I have a Sony a6400 that cost me a thousand dollars to shoot 4k video to get the same specs in a Canon. I have to dump seven grand. So perspective, but it's still expensive. <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of people shooting on red in just cause that they, they really brag about the dynamic range, which I'm not like, totally. It's awesome. The dynamic range is great. And being able to make subtle fixes uh, in post, in Premiere, that is awesome. But the thing of it is, is one, people take the idea of subtle changes way too far, thinking that they can just like not even care on set and just change everything in post. But the second thing that I've noticed, like, with these gimbals are getting so good that you can um, you can shoot sign on a gimbal that looks better than what you're going to get with a red because because of the heaviness of it and what it takes to be able to get that shot like you get you get this little bit of wiggle that I've seen like getting low angle shots that you you can see when sign was shot with a much heavier device. You, you see it in the frame, you see more imperfections. I noticed that myself recently watching an, uh, one of the Harry Potter films. I'd never noticed it before, maybe it's now just because I have a gigantic television and I was watching it in 4K. But there is a, uh, a gimbal shot that rotates, I think about 180 degrees when it reveals the Chamber of Secrets. And you can see because of the heavy Panasonic camera, you can see the jitters as it att attempts to move this fast and rotate. And I'm just thinking, wow, I, I, the fact that I can actually achieve a smoother shot now with my $300 gimbal is just amazing. <laughs> but one thing I, I will say about the um, dynamic range on the Sony's, I sent you that one shot with uh, where I was shooting in a garage and the garage was decently dark. I had to get these like really big powered lights to be able to shoot that. But even still, I was able to get enough dynamic range out of the Sony a7 III to be able to see what was going on in the garage and also see the detail in the sky. Like I did a little bit, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, I did some tweaking in the sky like uh, to recover a little bit more of that detail, but it was there. Yeah, and just to, to clarify on your end, because I know that not ever you know, people watching this aren't going to know what you were using. I know that you you didn't shoot that in you know what everyone would expect you to shoot it in either, which is S log. In order to have as much of that dynamic range as possible, these are the built-in hybrid log gamma profiles. And ever since I got those, oh man, this, <laughs> especially you know when you're shooting on you know, very hyper just like very overexposed you know sunny days it is remarkable what you can pull with those profiles without having to venture into s-log territory where you can kind of guess what it's going to look like in your head afterwards because the gamma assist on these cameras is okay but it is by no means perfect the only way to actually know what it will look like afterwards is if you know exactly which LUT you're going to put on it, how you're going to color grade it, and you can import it onto something like an Atomos. Otherwise, you're just flying by the seat of your pants shooting with that. And do never ever shoot with that inside. <laughs> that is one thing I did learn. There's this YouTube channel, Make Art Now, that has a wonderful tutorial on shooting low light on these cameras to get they're already awesome in low light, but to get that like extra punch and my goodness, what you can pull out of that. Yeah, these 
Sony's come a long way, and I hope that they don't start to lose the specs war that they kind of started, you know, with the A7S II. Um, I know that with the, uh, the the pandemic and everything, there's a lot of companies in Japan that are that are suffering, and we've already been waiting for an A7S III now for this August will be four years, I believe, since it was announced, um, or since the the two was announced, I should say, and we're still waiting. And then they said. Because of this, it's going to be delayed even further. So it's just like, oh, <laughs> come on. Just one delay after another. Do you, it, it really didn't seem that long ago that they were just like, hey, we're going to announce this. It's coming out. Uh, like, I thought we would be hearing about this like months and months ago. But hopefully, hopefully they're going to make a truly awesome camera. That's what what i'm hoping they can take the time that they need as long as they do it right and get the like power management and all that figured out yeah oh if it's if it's got you know because what we're already shooting with now the a7 threes are just wonderful the only thing that i think anybody is truly missing is that slow motion in 4k if they delivered that alone i think everybody would be a happy camper I know I would be. I would just be like, just shut up, give me money, give me, you know, take my money. <laughs> That's all. I, I, I hiccup through a lot of that. It's, all I want is 4K at 60p. That's all I want. Anything more than that is just a bonus. You give me that, take my money. Make it rain. I, I don't care about anything else. And I, I do want to ask, where can people find you online? Like if somebody wants to hire you for a client job or... Uh, your your main line of work weddings. Uh, where can they find you online? Um, I am all over, but the best place to find me is lightcraftentertainment.com. All uh, portfolios, pricing, access to you know my YouTube channel, all of that contact information is accessible there. Check it out. So it, it's really been wonderful talking to you, Blake. You too, man. Thanks for having me on. Also, you can find us at stargazerdigitalmedia.com. Please like, comment, and subscribe if that's something you want to do. I will see you guys next time. <laughs> <laughs>